2002 is a year that will forever live in infamy for James Bond fans. What should have been a triumph, the 40th anniversary of the James Bond franchise ended in disaster with the release of Die Another Day, which would turn out to be Pierce Brosnan's swan song as James Bond. Now, to give the film its due, this movie was not a box office flop. In fact, it was the most popular James Bond movie of all time up to the moment. But fans did not like this movie one bit, and neither did the general public. People mocked it for its over-reliance on CGI, its unfocused performance by Pierce Brosnan, the Madonna theme song, and much, much more. Clearly, something needed to be done about the franchise, but what? To their eternal credit, Eon Productions, headed by Michael G. Wilson and Barbara Broccoli, knew that something had to change. They saw Die Another Day, and with their critical eye, they knew just as well as James Bond fans that it was not a good movie, and that some big changes needed to be made. Now, here's where things get a little bit controversial. Pierce Brosnan ultimately would be replaced as James Bond. But when they were starting the 21st James Bond film, the idea was always that Pierce Brosnan was in fact going to return. Something interesting happened in the early 2000s. Eon Productions was able to reacquire the rights to both Never Say Never Again and the 1967 version of Casino Royale. Most importantly, it was also able to acquire the rights to film the Casino Royale novel, and they decided to use this as a base for the next James Bond movie. And it would be the first time that an Ian Fleming novel would actually be adapted in years. In fact, I think one has to go back all the way to Moonraker, if you could even call that an adaptation, because it really has almost nothing in common with the book that it's based on. Casino Royale would actually hem pretty closely to the plot, and the idea was always to make Vesper Lind, who was the Bond girl in that novel, the girl that James Bond finally falls in love with. Neil Purvis and Robert Wade got to work on the screenplay, and indeed grounded the film in an emotional connection between Lind and Bond. But here was the thing. At the time, Pierce Brosnan was already in his 50s, and for some reason they just didn't think that Pierce Brosnan would really be able to sell the love story aspect of the film. It didn't really make sense that James Bond, as hard-bitten as he is, and a veteran at this point, would so easily succumb to the charms of Vesper Lind and be totally won over by her. It probably could have worked if you cast a really strong and maybe older actress in the role, somebody that was closer to Pierce Brosnan's age, but as a typical James Bond movie, especially in the Pierce Brosnan mode, it was never going to work. So Pierce Brosnan was off filming after the sunset with Brat Ratner. There were negotiations and negotiations, and then one day he apparently got a phone call from Robert Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson saying that it was over, that they were moving on, and that he was a great James Bond. And Pierce Brosnan in the years since has not seemed to be particularly understanding of the desire to move on. In fact, I think Pierce Brosnan is a little bit bitter at the way that he was dismissed from the part, and one could get his point to some degree. Because the thing is, Die Another Day, and in fact all of his James Bond films were tremendously popular at the box office. Each successive installment was more popular than the last, so you could see why Pierce Brosnan probably thought he had a good thing going, and he deserved the a material that would eventually go to his replacement. So who was going to replace James Bond? Everybody was guessing at this point who was going to be the man to take over the 007 mantle, and so many names were thrown around. For a while, it looked like Julian McMahon, who was big off of Nip Tuck, could possibly get the role. In fact, a lot of people thought that he was a frontrunner, although it turned out to not be the case. In fact, the one that was the closest to getting the role of James Bond was actually Henry Cavill, who was one of two finalists. The other finalist was a blonde actor named Daniel Craig. Now, the reason a young Henry Cavill didn't get the part is because he was only in his early 20s at the time, and they just felt that he was too young to play the role, even if in the Casino Royale screenplay, James Bond isn't a full-fledged 007 agent yet and is actually just starting. The decision eventually was made to go with Daniel Craig, who was seen as a really off-kilter choice. For one thing, Daniel Craig, while very attractive, is not necessarily conventionally handsome in the Pierce Brosnan way. Another thing is the fact that he had blonde hair. This was such a huge sticking point for Sim James Bond fans. It's hard to even imagine now, but this was so controversial back then. Everybody was calling him James Blonde, and they were signing petitions online. Oh yes, everybody loves online petitions to replace him. And I remember the media just attacking him over and over again. Nobody thought that he was going to be good as James Bond, but boy, oh boy, did he show them. Yes. Considerably. 
Apparently the story is that Barbara Broccoli, from the time she saw Layer Cake and throughout all of his successive screen tests, knew that Daniel Craig was going to absolutely ace the role as James Bond. Even if other people didn't quite think that he was right for the part, Barbara Broccoli knew that Daniel Craig was the man, and her choice turned out to pay off massively because Daniel Craig transformed the role. The most obvious person to us was Daniel Craig. In fact, I don't even know if the series would still be going if you didn't have somebody like Daniel Craig playing the lead. For a grittier actor, they needed to have a grittier James Bond film. Enter the screenplay, which is by Robert Wade and Neil Purvis, with an assist by Paul Haggis, who was just coming off of winning an Oscar for Crash. This would be an origin tale in which a young James Bond is newly given his 00 designation after two assassinations. He's sent to play a high stakes poker tournament against the villainous Le Chiff, who's the money man for an international terrorist network. James Bond's job is to clean him out so that Le Chiff will be assassinated by his handlers. Now, people have often compared Casino Royale to Batman Begins, and indeed, you could almost call this film James Bond Begins. It rebooted the series in an exciting and fresh way, essentially reinventing the character for a whole new generation of filmgoers, but at the same time not ignoring the formula that made the franchise so successful. So let's get to the script, co-written by Paul Haggis. And it's very faithful to the In Fleming novel. In fact, I think most of the things that people really like about this movie come directly from the novel. One is the strong relationship between James Bond and Vesper Lynn, including that horrific final line when he says, The bitch is dead which is remarkably cold-blooded, but really does work for the character. Also, another scene that surprisingly made it intact into the film is the famous testicular torture scene with a carpet beater. Every single guy that went to see this movie was cringing and yowling throughout. Ah! Of course, the script is indeed peppered with a few really strong action sequences that do not exist in the book, but hey, you know what? It's still a James Bond movie and they had to deliver. I give the script for this one a really strong 9 on 10, one of the best James Bond scripts ever. Now, in terms of directors, there's one guy that's always been the perfect choice to reboot James Bond, and it's Martin Campbell. He did an amazing job with Pierce Brosnan for Goldeneye, and in fact, probably should have directed all the successive installments. He was brought on to direct Casino Royale in the hopes that he would do as good of a job in introducing Daniel Craig to filmgoers as he did with Pierce Brosnan, and boy oh boy did he ever pull it off. The opening parkour-inspired chase sequence is probably one of the best action sequences in the series and immediately, immediately established Daniel Craig as this really unique version of James Bond. I mean, look at the stunt work. This is Daniel Craig doing a lot of his own stuff. It's not just insert close-ups against CGI backgrounds. This is Daniel Craig really showing his mettle as an action star. <laughs> I think that anybody who had any doubt that Daniel Craig was born to play James Bond immediately after seeing this sequence changed their tune. In fact, I remember seeing this opening weekend, sitting in a movie theater, having two guys behind me going, oh man, at the end of the action sequence, and then whispering to each other, man, this is gonna be a really good movie. And indeed it was. Casino Royale is a really good movie, probably one of the best James Bond movies ever. So let's break it down a bit. Daniel Craig took so much grief for not being particularly Bond-like when he was announced, but fans all changed their tune the second they saw him in action, and he's incredible in this film. It's really exciting watching him on screen as you're getting the sense that a star is being born. The first time you really feel this way, actually, since maybe Sean Connery and Dr. No, you really see him coming into his own, and it's amazing. In fact, Daniel Craig was nominated for a BAFTA for his performance, and a lot of people thought that the Academy Awards were actually gonna nominate him for Best Actor. He was kind of a front runner for a while and in fact he should have been nominated. This is probably one of the best performances of 2006 but alas I believe the old fashioned academy is a bit prejudiced against an action film. He should have gotten nominated and I don't know maybe he should have won. Daniel Craig is amazing this movie. I give him a 10 on 10. You noticed. Now the villains. This is kind of unique because Mads Mikkelsen, who of course everybody knows now, was kind of an unknown when he signed on to play Le Chiffre, but it's a really good performance, and he's probably my favorite all-around James Bond villain since Sean Bean back in Goldeneye. He's a physical threat to Bond, and he has that amazing scar, and the scene where he tortures Bond with the carpet beater is amazing. But the interesting thing is that Le Chiffre is done away with while the movie still has about 40 minutes to go. This is maybe a little bit uneven, but that's how it is in the book, and I think it does work in the film's favor. Still, I'd give the villain and a strong 9 on 10. You changed your shirt, Mr. Bond. I hope our little game isn't causing you to perspire. Bond Girl, however. This is where Casino Royale outmatches almost any other film in the franchise, really. The absolutely gorgeous Eva Green stars as Vesper Lind. Gee, baby, ain't I good to you? Mm -hmm. 
the woman that broke Bond's surprisingly fragile heart. And you know, if there's one woman that could convincingly ever turn James Bond into a one-woman man, Ava Green would be the one to do it. I mean, she's terrific in this movie. Her acting is awesome. She looks so good in a black dress. Her chemistry with Daniel Craig is absolutely off the charts. She's vulnerable. She's strong. Eva Green is the real deal in this movie, and I would give her a 10 on 10. Probably the best James Bond girl ever. I don't know. Tell me in the talk back what you guys think of this, but she's got my vote. You've got your armor back on. How's that? I have no armor left. You stripped it from me. The Bond music, pretty good in this one. David Arnold is back to score Casino Royale and he performs a really solid score which is a lot different than his Die Another Day score. If that one was bogged down by the fact that they were trying too hard to adopt the style of other action scores at the time, I'll say this, David Arnold was able to go back and give us an old fashioned James Bond score, which is maybe a little less techno based than some of his earlier bass scores. It's really orchestral and it sounds really good. And it has a pretty good theme song by Chris Cornell, You Know My Name, which has a great opening sequence with his really cool animation, although I did find that they got rid of the James Bond girls that usually dance in the opening credits, which was perhaps a nod to PC culture. I give the score about an 8 on 10 and the theme song about the same. Now, this one is interesting because it doesn't have any gadgets, and in fact, Q isn't in the film. The biggest supporting part probably goes to Judy Dench as M, who gets out in the field a lot and is given a much bigger role here than M has ever gotten in another James Bond movie, because the chemistry between Judy Dench and Daniel Craig is really good. They have this kind of mother-son thing going that really works for the franchise. I thought M was a randomly assigned letter. I had no idea it stood for Utter one more syllable and I'll have you killed. Now, one of the things that has to be said about Casino Royale is that the action scenes are absolutely amazing. So there's the cool assassinations at the beginning that are done in black and white, ending with James Bond shooting a gun that turns into the gun barrel logo and had me standing up and cheering when I saw it in theaters. That amazing parkour sequence, the really cool airport chase where he blows the guy up. I thought that was awesome. And it's also got that cool ending in Venice, although I thought that that wasn't quite as good as some of the other action scenes in the film. But emotionally, I think it really works. The movie actually slows down quite a bit in the second half as James Bond plays poker, but man, I'll tell you, the stylish direction by Martin Campbell, the writing, the acting, it really makes you invest in the poker game. And I don't think that gambling has ever been as exciting on screen, maybe since, I don't know, maybe Rounders or something like that, as it is in Casino Royale. I mean, this is a really exciting poker game. I love this movie. I mean, this movie is amazing. Do you think of how much? Now, something that needs to be said is that Casino Royale, when it came out, was actually kind of soft at the box office. It was beaten on opening weekend by Happy Feet. Can you believe it? Happy Feet beat James Bond at the box office. But here's what happened. People started to talk about this movie and how amazing it was, and people started going back to see it two, three, four times. I don't even know how many times I saw it in theaters, but it was a lot. And eventually the movie grossed about 167 million in North America, which doesn't sound like a ton of money, but you have to remember this was a sleeper. The movie opened pretty soft, so nobody really thought that it was gonna even crack 100 million. So when it got to 167 million, this was a big deal and definitely assured the fact that the franchise would go on. And worldwide, the movie was an absolute mega hit. It ended up topping out at about $597 million worldwide, which is really good for a James Bond movie. Immediately, they went into production on a sequel, which admittedly, has kind of a mixed reaction amongst fans and definitely myself and we're gonna to get to that in the next installment but for one brief shining period the James Bond franchise was better than ever with Casino Royale which I give a 10 on 10 to. Now a lot of people have criticized the Daniel Craig films as being perhaps a little too reliant on the Jason Bourne formula that is something that would definitely come into play in the next film but Casino Royale to me is the perfect mixture of an old-fashioned James Bond movie with a new school spy thriller. It really is an amazing film and probably one of my favorite ones in the franchise. If you haven't seen it in a while, I tell you, you gotta go back and revisit it. In fact, this has been one of the best James Bond revisited for me personally because Casino Royale holds up like gangbusters. Again, a 0010 on 10? Alas, the franchise wouldn't be able to continue going quite so strong because Martin Campbell, as is usual for him, didn't want to come back and do another one, so they had to replace him with another director, and the results were mixed. But we'll talk about that next time. The name's Bond. James Bond. If you like this video and you like the James Bond Revisited series, 
make sure to click on the bell to receive notifications every time we post a new video. We're an independent company, and you know what? We appreciate all of your support.